Hey guys, and welcome to the first ever Maltcast Brewing Fundamentals video. The goal of this video is going to teach you guys basically everything that goes into an all grain beer, all the steps that are involved. I'm going to explain as much as I can um, throughout the process. But um, yeah, we're going to brew some beer today. We're brewing in a bourbon vanilla porter today. And uh, just to tell you guys what's in this, so it's got 22 pounds of two row. 5 pounds of Munich, 3 uh, pounds of brown malt, 2 pounds of Crystal 120, a pound of Crystal 40, a pound of chocolate, and then the um, the hops, it's 1 ounce, uh, one and a half ounce of Magnum at 60, and 2 ounce of East Kent at 10. And then we're going to ferment with Nottingham. So maybe let's take a step back a little bit and just talk about what actually goes into beer. So this is something that maybe you guys don't know. Uh, some of this is going to be review for you guys, but um, I figured we cover as many bases as possible today just to, yeah, uh, you know, make no assumptions and, and this is going to be a very, very fundamentals video. So the first thing that goes into beer is, of course, grain. Um, this happens to be Caramel 120, but there are literally hundreds of different grains available. Um, they're usually divided into two categories. You have base grain, and then you have specialty grains. Base grains, generally speaking, are um, the majority of your grain bill in a recipe. And then you have specialty grains that make up, I could be anywhere from five all the way up to maybe, I've even seen some where it's you know, 30, 40% of the grain bill. And um, so grain is the first thing. And uh, of course, barley is the main one that's used in beer brewing, but um, wheat, rye, uh, corn, rice, and I may be forgetting some other ones, but those are the primary ones that are used as well. Second ingredient in beer brewing is, of course, hops. These are hop pellets. Hops come in two forms. You have pellets and leaves. Um, they're pretty much used the same way. There's a little bit of um, school of thought that the pellets work a little bit better because the surface area is greater and um, the leaves tend to float and you know, it's, it's just uh, pellets are what are preferred. Third ingredient is yeast. This is dry yeast. Um, yeast comes in two forms, dry and liquid. And um, they can pretty much be used the same way. Dry yeast is actually generally rehydrated. You add water to it to, uh, to rehydrate the yeast cells. So it basically becomes liquid yeast after you do that. Then of course the fourth ingredient is water. So let's just talk a little bit about the process that we're going to use today. So first thing that we're going to do is we need to get the grain together and we need to mill it. So when grain comes like this, you guys can see those are whole grain kernels. Now we can't really use the grain in this form because it's too tough and um, the water won't be able to actually penetrate the kernel. So what we do is we mill the grain down um, and it basically cracks open all the shells um, you get a kind of a little bit of grain flour, but mainly you just kind of get these pieces of the shell um, and the endosperm inside. And then that allows us to mash the grain. So then what we do is once the grain's all been milled, we're going to then mash it. And basically with that, that's just a fancy word for uh, making like a hot porridge. So we take all the grain, we put it in a vessel, uh, usually a cooler to help uh, maintain the temperature during the 60 or 90 minutes that we're going to leave it. And then um, essentially at that point, after it's sat for that period of time at a certain temperature, what's going to happen is the, our enzymes in the grain itself, and those enzymes will convert the starches in the grain into sugars. And then what we do basically is we drain the liquid off, um, and the mash that vessel that we're using is what aids us to be able to do that. So what it has in the bottom is basically um, copper pipes that have small slits cut into it and basically what that acts like a sieve that allows the water to come out, the liquid to come out, but the grain itself stays in the vessel. And then once we collect that first liquid, we then, um, as we're collecting the liquid out, we're adding liquid in. So basically what's happening is the grains are getting rinsed of all their sugars. Once we collect the liquid, what we do then is we boil it. So the liquid is boiled with hops um, and usually for 60 minutes, um, that's how long we're going to do today. And um, once it's boiled, it's basically pretty much uh, ready to go. The only thing we have to do at that point is cool it down because obviously it's very, very hot. 
Uh, we don't want to put the yeast into that kind of an environment because it will actually kill the yeast. Um, so what we do is we cool it down and there's a few ways to do that. Uh, we're going to be using a counterflow chiller today. You could also just put the whole pot into an ice bath. That's uh, one way to cool it, but it's a little bit slower than the method we're using. Um, once it's cooled, basically we take our yeast that we will have rehydrated. We're going to put that into the beer and it's going to ferment for about two weeks. Um, and then at that point, we're going to do what's called secondary. This beer, because it is a special beer, it has some additional ingredients that are added after the fermentation stage. Um, we're going to be adding vanilla bean right to the uh, beer and we're also going to be adding some bourbon. Uh, that's what makes this a bourbon vanilla porter. Um, and then basically once that's done, we've added the stuff, we're going to let it sit again for about a week and then we're, you know, at that point you bottle or keg. I personally keg and uh, we'll show you what that's all about. But um, this beer, I'm brewing it actually in, um, in uh, August and it's probably not going to be ready until November, maybe even December. So um, this is one of the beers that uh, you need to age. It's a nice dark rich beer. Um, it needs time to kind of settle down, let the flavors mellow out and um, it should be good. So I'm going to explain as much of the process as I can to you guys today. Um, I apologize for those of you watching that are already experienced brewers. Uh, a lot of this is going to be repeat, but we're going to explain as much as we can. All right, guys, so the first step in the process, as I mentioned, is to get the grain milled. Um, this is the base grain that we've got. Um, we've got some other grain actually behind me here. So um, basically what we're going to do is we're going to put it into the mill, and the mill is basically two rollers attached to a drill. And basically what happens is the drill spins the rollers, uh, the grain gets pulled through the rollers, which crushes it, and then um, you'll see what we get on the other end. So basically what I'm going to do here, um, this is actually just my brew pot right now, but um, we're going to mill up all the grain and, um, and then we'll come back. So I'll just uh, do that right now. Just do it a little bit at a time here. You guys can see here we basically have gone from let me just show you this so we've basically gone from this which you guys saw before and now we have this so you can see we basically have a mixture of um, grain husks the cracked endosperm is the white part that you see so we're gonna get the whole bill milled up here and uh, we will come back when that's done all right guys, so you can see we've got all the grain milled up now. Um, this is actually some specialty grains on top, which is why it looks darker than the other stuff. Um, a lot of grain going into this beer. It's a 10 gallon batch. We actually have 34 pounds of grain going into this. That's actually the most um, that I've ever used in my mash tun. Uh, so it could be a little interesting. We'll see how that uh, turns out. Uh, it should hold it all, but it might be really close. Um, one thing to mention if you're gonna be doing all grain, you don't absolutely have to do this milling part yourself. Most homebrew stores will do it for you for um, either for free or for a very small fee. Uh, but if you are going to be buying grain in bulk, which I do to save money, it's a lot cheaper that way, um, you're going to obviously save money uh, by being able to mill it yourself. You don't want to have a, a big amount of, of grain pre-milled. It'll go stale a lot faster. Uh, so that's just one quick thing to mention. So what we're going to do now, we have all this milled. Um, we're going to get our strike water going and uh, I'm going to come over here and explain that to you guys right now. So what we've got guys heating up on the, uh, the uh, burner here is uh, the strike water. So the strike water is what goes into the mash um, initially when it does its you know, 16 minute soak. And um, you have to heat the mash, uh, the, the strike water up higher than you're intending the mash to be because basically what happens is the grain and the mash tun itself will cool it down because you know they're usually at room temperature so basically our target temperature today is about 152 and so we're going to heat the water up to about 168 and that should basically uh, hit it on the head for us once we add everything together so that's about the right temperature 
So what we're gonna do now basically is um, we're gonna add the water into the mash tun and then we're going to stir it all up and um, I'll show you guys what that looks like. So before we get into the actual mashing of this, I figured I'd just show you guys what the uh, mash tun looks like. So this is basically just a cooler. Uh, you can see it's been modified to have a ball valve fitting here on the front of it. Um, I'm not sure if you guys can see that from that angle, but there's a basically a ball valve fitting there. And then basically that goes through on the other side to this other fitting, which is uh, screwed on there. And then I've got a short length of tube, which then attaches to the manifold. And the manifold is basically the part of the mash tun that is the colander part. So I, I'll just, hopefully you'll be able to see this. So this basically has rows of slits cut into the copper pipe. So this is basically just a copper pipe, um, you know, four elbows, a T, and then four straight pieces. And basically what we have is, um, they're not even actually welded together. You can see they're, they're just loosely fit. And that actually they, stays together really well in the mash tun, but it actually allows it to be cleaned a lot easier afterwards. So uh, we'll get this in here and then we'll get going. All right, so we've got our strike water in here, guys. Now, one of the things that I like to do before I start adding my grain is just to check for leaks. Um, it's a lot easier to take the water out <laughs> once you, uh, if you find a leak than it is to take the grain out. Uh, if you find a leak after the grain's all in here, you're gonna be very unhappy and it's gonna be a big pain in the butt. So we've got the water in. We're basically at this point gonna slowly stir in our grain. So we'll start here. Now while we're doing this, I'll just mention really quickly that um, the interesting thing about mash temperature is that it can actually really affect the uh, quality and, um, not quality necessarily, sorry, but the taste of your beer. So if you mash at a lower temperature, it actually gives you a thinner body to your beer. So a, a uh, lower temperature is often used for like a, a clean crisps, uh, pale ale, or something of that nature. Um, if you want a full bodied, uh, you know, more bold beer, generally you mash at a higher temperature. And uh, I could get into the chemistry of why that is, but probably uh, exceeds what's really required for this video. Suffice to say that um, the general range is anywhere from 148 all the way up to about 160. 160 is the highest kind of you'd want to go kind of and um, you know that would give you a, a pretty full body beer not as fermentable leave more sugars in the beer and I apologize about the sound of the train that keeps coming by but uh, there's not much we can do about that but um, as I was saying about 160 is the highest you want to go uh, after that you start to really get out of the range where the enzymes can kind of work in conjunction with each other so um, I'm usually right around 152, 154. Sometimes I'll go up to um, 156 or 158 for like a really, uh, you know, like a really malty beer or something like that. So we'll just keep adding this in here. We're just generally stirring, trying to avoid getting any clumps of grain and whatnot. Yeah, we are really gonna be testing the grain limits of this mash tun today. So you can already see we're, uh, getting up here and we still have about eh, a little less than half of the grain left to actually add so um, hopefully this works out for us all right One of the great things about brewing is when you uh, are doing this, it just smells awesome, this mixture. Just to let you guys know too, so I'm mashing at about one quart per pound of grain. Um, that's a pretty thick mash ratio. Most people mash in the range of um, one and uh, 1.33, so one and a third. Um, quarts per pound or 1.25 quarts per pound of grain. I'm doing a little bit thicker because like I said, I'm really at the limits kind of of what this thing can hold. So I figured about one quart per pound 
should probably put me right about the limit of what this thing can actually hold, so. Just trying to get this mixed up as best you can. Trying not to dislodge the manifold in your bottom of your cooler. You're trying to avoid hot spots, clumps of grain, that kind of thing. So we've nearly got all of it added. I might actually mash this for 90 minutes because it's so thick. I want to make sure I get complete conversions. So I think we might actually go ahead and uh, do a 90 minute instead of the normal 60 that I do for the mash. We'll just go ahead and um, check how we're doing temperature wise. So like I said, we were shooting for about 152. So we should be fairly close to that. We'll just see how we did. Yeah, we're a little bit below our target. I'm seeing about 148. But that's not a big deal. Um, we actually originally were going to target 152, but uh, 148 should still be relatively in the range that we want. Um, it's, it's a little bit lower than I would like, but you know, um, I've never done a mash this thick, so the calculation was a little bit off, but um, that's not too big of a deal. So we're going to let this sit for 90 minutes, and then uh, we'll come back and we'll start sparging. All right, so our sparge water has been heated to exactly where we want it to be at. Hopefully you guys can see that, uh, 168. So at this point, we're going to kill the heat on the burner and we're gonna start sparging. So first what we need to do is um, do the, the Vorloff that I mentioned. So I'm gonna show you guys how that's done. So basically what we do is we start just by opening the valve here. And you can see the liquid that comes in initially is very dark. That's actually what they call the first runnings. And uh, we're probably going to need to... So it's hard to tell with a really dark beer like this when it's kind of clear enough. I will usually drain about two quarts or so, um, and then that, that's usually the point at which it starts to get nice and clear. It's actually running pretty clear now. I'm not sure if you guys can see that very well, kind of against the side of the container there, but um, it's not looking real cloudy or anything. So what we'll do now is we'll just uh, kill this. And we're just going to basically gently dump this liquid back on top so as not to disturb the grain. And we can basically start draining into our boil kettle now. All right, so let's get things draining into the boil kettle here. So we'll just somewhat gently not all the way open, but uh, probably about halfway. And as that's running in, basically what I like to do is um, just get my sparge water. And then essentially what I just do is um, use my the back of my spoon to just kind of disperse it. So you just very slowly and gently as water is, uh, as the liquid is running out, you're basically just gently adding more back. This is known as continuous sparging. Some people run theirs very, very slowly. I don't tend to fuss around a lot with it. Um, I kind of run my sparge probably only in about 10 minutes or so. Some people will do it over the course of like an hour or even more. I've found that this gives me pretty good efficiency, uh, somewhere in the range of 80 if not a little bit more. Um, on this brew, it'll probably be a little bit lower just because there is so much grain in here. So 
you just kind of keep a little bit of liquid above the grain at all times. You can kind of see there, there's you know, some liquid there. So one thing I should mention quickly guys as we're sparging here is that there's basically three ways you can do this. The method I've mentioned which is this continuous sparging. There's batch sparging which is basically where you add a f one or two more batches of water to the thing. So basically what you do is after you are done mashing you drain the whole thing of liquid then add a whole another batch of water to the thing, stir it up, do the boil off again and drain. You do that once or twice. And then there's basically no sparge. You add all the water and the grain to the mash tun, and you just drain it in one shot. I'm hoping you guys can see how light that's running here now that we're almost to the end of the sparge compared to when we started. So you can see kind of as you rinse the grains, you, uh, it gets lighter and lighter. We're nearly done here. So you can see we're collecting quite a bit actually because um, we want 11 gallons after the boil is finished and um, we're probably going to lose about a gallon, gallon and a half during the boil. So we're collecting about uh, 13 gallons here. So just to recap what we've done so far. So what we did basically was we took our grain, we mashed it, um, we left it till the starches were converted to sugars. And now we've collected the liquid from that. And what we're gonna do now is we're gonna boil this with hops for 60 minutes and uh, we'll be good. Now, I feel it's important to mention, especially for those of you that are watching this that have never brewed before, you're probably thinking, wow, this looks really intimidating. There's a lot of stuff, that you, equipment you need, stuff you have to have. Well, there's a really easy shortcut it's called extract brewing. Now what you can do basically is skip everything I've done up to this point and you basically start with a condensed syrup version of this liquid. And what you basically do then, you fill the pot with water, you add the extract, which is like I said a syrup, it dissolves in the water, and then you basically have this. So you're bypassing all the work we've done up to this point. Um, it's a lot easier to do, it's a little bit more expensive, and um, you don't have as much control over the beer, but um, it's a fantastic method if you guys are starting out. And I'm gonna be doing a video on extract brewing at some point, but um, just my brew schedule, um, this is what we were brewing, so this is what we're shooting to show you guys how to do. So um, we're gonna get this up to the boil, and um, when we get there, I'll explain the hot break stage to you guys, and, um, and we'll go from there. So you guys can probably see here, we're getting pretty close to the boil. We're still about 10, 15 Fahrenheit off, but you can see we're starting to get this foamy material on top. This is what's known as the hot break, and this is a stage you really need to be careful for. Um, you're not gonna get this, um, I'm sorry, you are gonna get this with extract as well. So any type of brewing, when the mixture is basically coming up to the boil, you're gonna get this. What's basically gonna happen when it starts to boil is this is gonna foam really, really badly on top. So you really want to, you know, have your finger on the the temperature control for your burner, whether on the stove or outside, because you do not want this to boil over. It'll make a huge mess. So essentially what we do is, once it gets to the stage where it's starting to foam up, we kind of back off the, um, the gas or the electricity, whatever you're using, and then it'll kind of settle a little bit and you just kind of fiddle with it until uh, eventually it will go away. It takes usually a few minutes to go away. And then you're, once you're past it, it's fine. Basically what's happening is the protein is coming to the surface and then at some point it's gonna reabsorb into the mixture and then you'll be completely fine for the rest of the boil. 
Um, you don't want to add any hops or anything until you're past the hot break. Otherwise, it makes, you know, a, really, really increases your chances of making a really big mess with your boil. So we're going to keep a really close eye on this as we get up, to, get up here because we're pretty close to the uh, hot break now. You can see it's just starting to boil on the edges there. So we're, this is the critical stage where we need to watch it like a hawk. See, it's really starting to rise now. So we just kill the gas almost completely. Actually, we're gonna have to kill it completely there. Just give it a second to settle. All right, so now that we are past the hot break, basically what we're gonna do is we're gonna set a timer for 60 minutes. And we're gonna do our first hop addition, which is an ounce and a half of Magnum. So when you add the hops, this is a stage when you need to be careful as well, just because the um, it's almost like the Mentos Coke type of a thing where uh, I guess, I don't know, the hops just tend to make it foam up more, so you just kind of got to really wash it when you do this. my very scientific method of half the bag. Yeah, so as I said, so you can definitely see we're past the hot break now. Uh, the, that whole cap of foam we had is reabsorbed. We're not really getting a lot of foam on top. So uh, I could probably even increase the, um, the gas a little bit. But yeah, we're gonna boil this for 60 minutes. Um, at this point, usually I'll kind of get the rest of my stuff ready. Um, you don't need to keep as close an eye on it at this point. And um, we'll come back at, um, I think it's 10 or 15, I forget, I'll look it up, but uh, we'll do the next hop edition and come back. All right guys, so while things are boiling, I like to get other stuff ready um, at the same time, just to uh, keep things a little more efficient. So I've actually cleaned uh, the mash tun and a bunch of other stuff. So one thing we haven't discussed at this point, which it's important uh, if you've never brewed to talk about, is sanitization. So everything that comes in contact with the cooled beer needs to be sanitized and cleaned. Well, cleaned and sanitized. And um, you don't really have to worry about that before the boil because, you know, the boil is going to deal with any bacteria or anything. But um, after the beer is cooled, basically what you've done is you've created this really, really great sugary environment. And there are a host of things that would love to live in there and infect your beer. Uh, you got wild yeast, you've got bacteria, lactobacillus, all these other things. And so you need to sanitize to make sure that none of that stuff is between the beer and the fermenters. So this is what I use. Um, this is actually what a lot of brewers use. It's called Star Sand. Um, it's an acid sanitizer, and this stuff is awesome. You can reuse it. So once you've sanitized, you can you know put it in another bucket, cover it up, and uh, you know you don't have to dump it out at the end. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to sanitize the fermenters themselves. These are both the fermenters. We're going to sanitize the lids. Here we're going to sanitize the bungs and airlocks, and then we're going to sanitize the other stuff that's going to come in contact to it, with it when it's cooling. Um, the transfer tubing, anything we're going to use to stir it, and as well we're going to sanitize what the yeast is going to be rehydrated in. So basically anything that is going to come in contact with it after it's been cooled. So um, what we'll do basically is just, we have five gallons or so of water here. Actually, it's probably more like six gallons. 
And uh, so we're just going to basically stir in some star sand. So star sand, you do it at a, at a ratio of one ounce per five gallons. So we've got a little bit more than five gallons. So we'll do a little bit more than an ounce. That just goes right in there. And then we'll get that stirred up. And uh, we're going to basically just plop everything down in there that needs to be sanitized. Take these apart. Put those in there. Put in this. We're probably going to use that to strain out some of the hops. And um, I'll get the transfer tubing and the other stuff in there. My counterflow war chiller, I'll, I'll just show you guys what that looks like. So what it is basically, this is what we're going to use to cool. And um, essentially what it is, is it's a length of hose. Um, hopefully you guys can see that okay. So this is basically a coiled length of hose. And what happens is the cold water um, enters in here and the hot water comes out here. The hot beer enters here and the cold beer exits down here. The, the hose itself, inside the hose there is a thin diameter of copper tubing. That's what the beer runs through, is that copper tubing. The water runs between the tubing and the hose. So you basically have this hot um, stream of beer and then a water jacket outside of that that's running cold water through. So basically as the beer travels down the length of this, it's cooled. So by the time it comes out here, it's the same temperature as the water from the hose. So that's a really, this is a very, very efficient method of cooling. So um, we're gonna basically try to sanitize um, both of these tubes that are gonna be involved in transferring the beer, as well as the inside copper tube. So what I normally do is just run a bunch of sanitizer through this um, and get everything basically sanitized that way. So uh, we'll do that and uh, we'll come back in um, about 20 minutes we're gonna do the last hop addition. All right, so you guys can see here, I'm just siphoning um, the sanitizer from one bucket into the other through the chiller. So um, that's gonna be all sanitized inside. And then basically um, the end of this, which will probably be in the bucket of beer, um, I'll just make sure I, I soak the outside of that tube in the sanitizer. Um, one thing I forgot to mention about Star Sam that uh, makes it so fantastic and why it's my um, sanitizer of choice is um, it's actually no rinse. Um, so I'm trying to show you guys on the bottle here. Yeah, here we go. Okay, so this might be a little tough to see, but um, let's see here. All right, right there. That line, do not rinse after application. Star Sand is a no rinse sanitizer. Some of the other sanitizers, you have to rinse them off everything afterwards you don't have to do that with star sand that's what's so great about it and the residue that it leaves actually uh, breaks down into something that's he healthy and good for the yeast so it's uh, almost like a little bit of a food for the yeast sort of at least what that's that's what they claim I don't know what the chemistry behind that would be but um, anyway so we're getting everything sanitized here um, and we will come back in just a little bit for the last hop edition I'm just going to show you guys quickly about the yeast rehydration. So I've got the um, Hyrex measuring cup that I usually use for this in the sanitizer already. So what we're going to do is we're going to grab, this is water that's been boiled already, um, just to kind of sanitize and sterilize the water. So we're going to pour out about two cups or so. You can do less than that, but a little bit more never hurts. All right, so I've allowed the water to cool a little bit. So it's basically at the temperature I'm gonna be pitching, um, sorry, that the beer is gonna be at when it's pitched in. So basically what we're gonna do at this point is just take the sachet of yeast. So this is the dry yeast I showed you guys earlier. Um, this is 31 and a half grams of yeast. Now, for most beers, you can get these little um, packets that are good for five gallon batches. Um, if you're doing a big beer like this one, you wanna use a little bit more. There are actually your yeast calculators you can use. I'll put a link to one in the description below. Um, 
it's really, really easy. You just put in uh, your expected gravity. Um, but like I said, you know, for, for most applications, one packet per five gallons is about right. So we've got the, um, the sanitized container here with the water in it. Basically what we're gonna do is just sprinkle this on top. And then we're just gonna take this piece of tin foil and sanitize that also. And then we're just gonna cover this up. And um, we'll give that about 15-ish minutes to um, just gently rehydrate. Then we'll uh, give it a stir and um, we'll be good to go. All right, so according to our timer, we've got 10 minutes left in the boil. So we're gonna go ahead and add our two ounces of East Kent Goldings at this point. And again, we just wanna be careful. It shouldn't foam up on us at this point, but um, you never know. You never wanna be, as we drop the package in, you never wanna be um, complacent, uh, complacent, because as soon as you do that, that's when you get disasters, so. And we'll just open up the other one and add that. We've got 10 minutes left and then uh, we'll come back and uh, we'll show you guys the rest of the process. All right, so the boil is now finished. So basically what we're gonna do is we're gonna get the wort, that's what it's called, at this point, um, drained from the boil kettle into the fermenters. And again, we're going through the, the chiller that we have. All right, so we've got the hose hooked up. Um, let me just swing this over a little bit. So you guys uh, can actually see this. So basically the hose is hooked up to the, um, the water in on the chiller. So we're basically gonna let that run through. And then we have on the other side, um, the hot beer is going through here um, into that manifold I told you about. And it's gonna be coming out uh, this end. So I'm gonna use this just to, um, this has been sanitized. I'm gonna use this to just strain out some of the hops. I actually forgot to put my hop screen, which is supposed to go in the boil kettle. Um, so we're gonna have to just improvise a little bit here. So it shouldn't be too big of a deal. So uh, we're gonna open up the valve on this kettle here. We've got a little bit of sanitizer coming out. So we'll just drain that outside the fermenter. It's not a big deal if it goes in the fermenter, but um, I generally prefer that it doesn't. Alright, so we're starting to get beer, so we'll go ahead and do this in here. And yes, we are getting some hops. You guys can probably even see that a little bit. I just wanted to catch some of this initial to breathe. There shouldn't be a lot after this. This is just the kind of a little bit that was really in the bottom there. So that, that should be okay now. So yeah, we'll drain this in here. And um, this probably will take uh, five or ten minutes or so. And then um, once this is all cooled down and drained, we'll come back and um, we'll continue. All right, so while we're waiting for that to transfer, I just wanted to come back to the yeast. Um, so you can see it's kind of starting to rehydrate. So um, I'm gonna take the end of this. This is the, the thermometer, it's been sanitized. And I'm just gonna kind of stir this up a little bit. Some people that have never brewed before I'm probably looking at this and going, that looks disgusting, but um, that is the wonderful world of yeast, my friend. These are the organisms that give us the nectar we love. Let's clean off the end there. That's good. 
and then we'll recover that and um, leave it for another 10-15 uh, minutes or so and it should be basically ready to go into the beer at that point so we'll come back in a little bit all right guys so we've got the, the beer transferred or the warts rather it's not beer yet until it's fermented but uh, we've got it transferred into the sanitized fermenters so I um, I've got the yeast here we're just going to give this another little swirl get everything uh, mixed up nice and good and uh, we're going to pitch basically half into each so I'm just going to do that through the hole here and hopefully we don't make a mess everywhere but uh, We'll just put these back in and we're going to actually maybe I'll show you this this to you guys in case you've never used an airlock before so essentially what we've got is there's three pieces to an airlock you basically have um, the lid you have the main body which has sort of a stem that comes up from the beer and then there's this cap that goes on. And let me just show you basically what happens. So you fill, the, fill this up about halfway with star sand. Hope you'll be able to see this. So basically what happens is the water creates a barrier between the air and um, inside and outside. So what can happen is the CO2 can easily bubble out, but air can't get in. So that's basically why we use these, is to create that, that barrier that allows the CO2 to still come out. So we'll fill up the other one as well. So as I said, this beer is going to ferment for about uh, two weeks, and then we're going to do the secondary, and I'll probably film that for you guys as well, just so you can see that part. But. Um, let me just show you one other thing here. Yeah, I was going to show you guys the temperature that this is currently at, but um, I can see it vaguely, just very faintly myself, but um, I don't think you can actually see it on the camera. No, it doesn't look like it. It's sitting at about 70-ish right now, so that's uh, pretty good for, for what we want. So we've pitched the yeast in, and uh, this is going to ferment away, and um, in about two weeks we'll have beer. So that's it guys, that is an all green brew day in a nutshell. Um, how do you relax after a nice long brew day? Of course, with a nice cold home brew. This is a dogfish head uh, 60 minute clone that I made. And uh, you can see it is nice and clear. Just a beautiful beer. Um, really nice and clear, you can see my finger through it. Great head retention. Mm. Oh yeah, that is so good. So um, part two of this video will probably be posted um, yeah, in about two weeks or so. And uh, I'll show you guys the secondary, or maybe three weeks. Maybe I'll, I'll combine the secondary and the kegging part of it uh, into one video. So um, I hope this has been informative. I'm sorry if some of this information has been repeats for you guys that are already have already brewed or experienced but wanted to cover all the bases today as much as possible if there's something I didn't cover or something that's unclear go ahead and post a question in the comments below um, I'll try to answer everybody that has any questions about brewing but um, brewing is great I mean I would never go back to buying beer except for special occasions or special beers um, it, it's such a rewarding hobby you have obviously the money saving part of it but it's also the the pride and the um, just the hobby aspect. I mean, it, it's like any kind of culinary, um, you know, hobby or whatever. It's you know, it's fantastic. You see everything that's gone into it. Um, it's really fun to be creative and come up with 
um, inventive things or new things you haven't tried before. And then it's, you know, it's so rewarding when at the end of the day you can just sit down with something delicious and ice cold. Mm. Oh, I wish you guys could taste this. It's so good. Anywho, that's been it for me. I um, want to give a couple quick, couple quick plugs here. Um, so if you guys don't know about Mallcast, we have a podcast that we do once every two weeks. We cover craft beer news, uh, homebrew news, and we try to cover kind of fundamentals and different things like that. Uh, so it's kind of a hybrid between a craft beer podcast and a homebrewing podcast. Really, they're two sides of the same coin, in my opinion. Um, so go check that out. We are at maltcast.com. Uh, you can find us on iTunes, Stitcher, anywhere podcasts are found. Um, or um, hit up our Facebook page, facebook.com slash maltcast, twitter.com slash maltcast, and of course, you're at youtube.com slash maltcast. But if you guys would hit subscribe, um, that really helps us out. We appreciate that. And um, stay tuned, guys, for more. That's been it for me. Until next time, guys, cheers and happy homebrewing. Mm. Yeah, like I said, this is about the thickest you'd want to go for a mash, just because of the fact that um, if you go any thicker than this, the grain won't be really sufficiently wet. So, we'll get this stirred up as, as we can as we break our spoon here. Like I said, it's a thick mash, folks. That's what happens.